I'm the new kid on the block. But I'm the only local boy here. This church was founded in 1888. The, bu the building that stood before this building and the other building was carted here on horse-drawn carts from Carterville, Missouri and set up here. But in Christmas of 1927, it burned down to the ground. Had a potbelly stove. Somebody got too hot and it burned the house down. It was replaced by the building that used to sit out closer to the street. That's where I met the Lord. I was born on Diamond Grove Prairie. If you will go down the hill to the creek called Grove Creek and then go a mile and a half east and half a mile north, you will find the overgrown foundations of Diamond Grove City. It's still there. Built in the wrong place. It died. But the church did not. It still exists today. I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ in 1948. I was baptized into Christ January the 26th, 1949. And I met him at this place. I'm a local boy. I have taught my grandson, Jonathan, to say... I am Jonathan Thomas, the firstborn of Thomas Gordon, the firstborn of Gordon Lee, the firstborn of George Hugh, the son of John Wesley, the son of Harrison Carter, the son of John, the son of Christley, the son of Jacob who fought in the Revolutionary War and settled in Pennsylvania where now there is Souderburg and Souderville. They moved to Washington County, Indiana, where all of you people are from. <laughs> and there came in contact with the Restoration Movement in its very early days. Great Grandpa John came across the Mississippi with his few belongings, his family, and a Bible under his arm. He was never called a preacher, but he was called an elder. Back in those days, they believed that every believer ought to be knowledgeable in the scriptures, and he was. He settled in Gasconade County, Missouri. His three sons, my great-grandfather Harrison Carter, George Washington, and Columbus. <laughs> Can you believe this? The three brothers moved from Gasconade County down to what was called Green County, since become Ozark County, and founded Souder, Missouri, and the Souder Christian Church. Souder has lost its post office, but not the Spirit of God. The church is still there. I was there this spring. I'm a local boy. Y'all welcome. <laughs> I wonder sometimes whether we know, because I'm just amazed at how God moved my ancestors all over this great United States so that I would be born on Diamond Grove Prairie and go to Ozark Bible College and marry the dean's daughter. Fell in love with and I've been married to for 44 years. Let me say just before I finally get to the text that I want to talk about this morning, I have been impressed by the speeches given, by the song sung, by the Spirit of God moving in this place. But do you want to know what has impressed me the most? Say yes, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I have been most impressed by the dress and the decorum of the young people in this meeting. How come only two of you applauded? What's the matter with our room? You need to make a decision. It's three o'clock, time to go home. About whether you're going to stay, I have the practice, if you quit listening, I quit talking. And if you walk out, I'm gone. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. 
But what do I know about love? I'm a guy. Because I'm a guy, I must hold the television remote in my hand while I watch TV. If I misplace the thing, I'll miss the whole show looking for the thing. One time I was able to survive by holding a calculator. <laughs> now, I'll hold your palm pilot, but I won't hold your hand. Because I'm a guy, when I lock my keys in the car, I fiddle with a wire clothes hanger and ignore your suggestions to call road service until long after hypothermia has set in. And when the car isn't running too well, I pop the hood and stare at the engine as if I knew what I was looking at. And if another guy shows up, one of us will say, I used to be able to fix these things, but boy, these days with the computers and everything, I don't know what I'm looking at. Because I'm a guy. When I catch cold, I need someone to bring me soup and take care of me while I lie in bed and moan. Because I'm a guy, I can be expected to purchase basic groceries at the store like milk or bread, but I cannot be expected to find something called cumin or tofu. For all I know, they're the same thing. Because I'm a guy, when one of our appliances stops working, I will insist on taking it apart, despite the evidence that it would just cost me twice as much when the repair person finally gets there and has to put it back together. Because of my guy, no, I don't think we're lost. No, and I don't think we should stop and ask someone. Why would you listen to a complete stranger? How would he know where we're going? Because I'm a guy, don't ask me if I like the movie. Chances are, if you're crying at the end, I didn't. Because I'm a guy, I think what you're wearing is fine. I thought what you were wearing five minutes ago was fine, too. Either pair of shoes is fine. With the belt or without it, it's fine. Your hair is fine. You look fine. Could we go now? I'm a guy. Because I'm a guy, would I know the love of God if I met it in the middle of the street? Were you as deeply disappointed as I when I did a search for the meanings of the words in our assigned text? I began with that word love. W.E. Vine, that final authority on words of the New Testament scriptures in his expository dictionary of the New Testament words has the audacity to say that the word agape is used to express an idea previously unknown. That inquiry into its use, whether in Greek literature or in the Septuagint, throws but little light on its distinctive meaning in the New Testament. Marvin R. Vincent, in his word studies in the New Testament, says, Agapao does not appear in the classical Greek writings. Would you please now, in this speech, insert that whole dissertation that you heard from Jonathan Ingram that excellent treatise on the definitions of law. I mean, just, i give you seven seconds, download. <laughs> Three, two, one. But know this. It is easier. More easier. Is there such a word? Far more easy to talk about love and to attempt to define it, brother, than it is to love some of God's problem children, let alone love your enemies. And if you deny that, you come and call with me. I will show you how to exercise your love capacity. Because we are children of the age of enlightenment, we have held that knowledge will drive away the darkness, the darkness of ignorance and superstition. The scriptures, however, show that Jesus and his chosen apostles held a different view. Amen. It was their view 
That love drives away the darkness of ignorance and the superstition. Jesus came to dispel the darkness of the world, the darkness of sin and ignorance by love. By his love. By his love poured into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. May I point out to you that while God's power and wisdom are self-evident in that which he has made, his love is not self-evident. Hear Paul. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. But his love is not so clearly perceived. Some find it hard to believe in the love of God. They see constant struggle for existence that is ceaselessly waged among all living things. Man fights man, beast fights beast, bird fights bird, fish fights fish. To the seeing eye, the world is all a battlefield. Every living creature is at arms, fighting for its life. The watchword of nature is not peace, but war. War for the right to live. War for room to grow. War for food to eat. In grim and fearful silence, the war goes on. Darwin and Nietzsche and Hitler called it the survival of the fittest. Can you wonder that men who have known all that and only that have ceased to believe in the love of God? Nature, groaning and travailing in pain together, seems to cry out against the love of God. And then there are the problems of human pain and sorrow and bereavement. It broke me when you, when you prayed for Missy. The suffering of your most beloved. The crying of a little child screaming in fearful agony day and night. The disasters that bring fear and pain and loss. Tornado Flood, earthquake, fire, terrorist bomb, gunman. God, how can you permit this? God, if you love, prove it. Ah, oh, well. It is at this very point that the Apostle Paul takes up his discourse in our assigned text of Romans 5. He says, as recorded in verses 2 through 5, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings. <clears throat> Please note that Paul's worldview is exactly opposite of the presently commonly held world view. I'll start again. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. Now, Paul, Brother Paul, please forgive me, but this is one of your other hard sayings. I don't wish to suffer. I avoid suffering. I try to not make any serious decisions when I'm suffering. Oh, and there are so many kinds of suffering. There, there's the suffering of the body, the suffering of mental conflict, the suffering of interpersonal relationships. How can we be at peace while we're still suffering? Can we rejoice while suffering? I've got a clue for you. Not many of you are all that pleasant to be around when you're suffering. 
But God deals with the struggle of man, the suffering of man, the fear of man. God's method of dealing with his wayward, troubled, suffering, rebellious children is by pouring his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Write it down. Tattoo it on your wrist. Say it out loud three times. God's method for dealing with his wayward, troubled, suffering, rebellious children is by pouring his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God is aware of and deals with the very issues of life that have caused some to believe that he does not love us. He deals with those issues by pouring his love into our hearts. If you don't allow the pouring, you will not be able to deal with the issues. Amen. You will come to hate, hate your fellow men, hate God, the God of love, and hate yourself. Paul draws a picture of development in the life of a believer in the use of the word pouring. For the purpose of memory of these important elements of the pouring by love by the Holy Spirit, you need, if you're taking notes, to start at the bottom of the page and get some child to help you because it's a drawing. And some of you've lost the art of drawing. Get some little kid to help you. The four parts of the plant that I want to bring to your mind are the stem, the leaves, the blossom, and the fruit. The pouring of the love of God into our hearts, I will liken to the pour of water onto a plant. The water carries the necessary nutrients to the part of the plant so that it grows and thrives and produces. Every believer can grow and produce fruit when he allows the Holy Spirit to pour the love of God into his heart to strengthen his life in the four parts of his life. First, draw the stem. Start at the bottom, give you a good root system. Draw your stem, don't make it too small. Pretend it's a tree or a large plant on which you can write the word suffering because that's the stem of your life. I don't know whether you've caught on to that yet or not, but any of you who are not suffering in the body aren't in the body, you're dead already and don't know it. Suffering is the stem of your life. Get used to it. The Holy Spirit of God pours God's love into your heart to enable you to deal effectively with the suffering. Now, there's two areas of that. He can help you deal with your own suffering, and he can help you to deal with other people's suffering. First, look at your own suffering. You can deal with your suffering if you know that God loves you instead of thinking that God's getting even with you through your suffering. Now, in the midst of your suffering, the Holy Spirit pours God's love into your heart like the pouring of refreshing rain on parched earth. The pouring denotes both abundance and diffusion. I mean, there's a lot of pouring going on. There's a lot of water to be poured. And a lot of parched earth, the pouring denotes that abundance and that effusion. The idea of spiritual refreshment and encouragement is conveyed through the metaphor of watering in this verse. Now, in the matter of the abundance of the love of God, for one to speak of the love of God, huh, it's like I went out in my backyard, which I plowed up and made into a garden because I hate mowing grass. The, huh, it takes me about seven minutes to mow what's left in my yard. My wife won't let me get riding mower. I don't know what her problem is. <clears throat> It is as though I went out in my backyard and scooped up a handful of dirt and said, I hold earth in my hand. To talk about the love of God. Nevertheless, you ought to get dirty. From the dirt comes nutrients. What the Holy Spirit pours into your heart is not self-pity. What the Holy Spirit pours into your heart is not a martyr complex. Oh, I know the ministry can be tough. I've been there, done that in several countries. But what the Holy Spirit pours into your heart is not an attitude that makes everyone around you miserable. 
The Holy Spirit helps you avoid suffering by keeping you away from an injurious lifestyle. The Holy Spirit helps us making good choices that contribute to our health and not to our suffering. <clears throat> so many things come to mind and I need to stay with the manuscript. I said, you know, it really hurts in the joints. And my wife said, stay out of the joints. <clears throat> we need to stay away from certain places. It's not healthy. The Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts to turn our attention from ourselves to others, and that's the second part. You see, God enables me to deal with the suffering of others. Did you know that love listens? You know what we're good at? Yeah. I'm afraid that most of the time humans don't want to hear about anybody else's suffering. After all, they've got all the suffering of their own they can handle. More suffering is certainly not what we're looking for. It takes discipline to listen. But we can hardly keep our mouths shut. We start talking almost immediately, even interrupting. Learn to listen. Listen unto understanding. Understanding how the other one feels emotionally. And what is not required when another is suffering, or even doing that which you disapprove, what is not required is your clever quip. You may be proud of your cleverness, but it is not the activity of the Holy Spirit pouring love into a heart. Love connects. Study to know whom you can help and for whom you can get help. One of the best activities in which you can engage is to know how to get two other parties together to benefit each other. It is obvious you cannot take care of every need of every person that you meet. Secondly, the stem of suffering produces leaves. This, get your drawing out, start again. The Holy Spirit pours God's love into your hearts to develop your endurance. Did you write suffering on the stem? Write endurance on the first leaf that it produces. Some of you think you're tough just because you're hard. The toughness that the Holy Spirit pours in by his love is the kind that is in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, till death do us part kind of endurance. Some of you are afraid to love, to really love, because you don't want to get hurt again. And so you become hard instead of vulnerable. You protect yourself. You are afraid to love the one who does not agree with you. You are afraid to love the one who engages in activity in which you would not engage. I got three leaves that I really want you to grow. Leaves of endurance. I want you to grow a leaf that reaches out. It reaches out like a mother's love that sacrifices sleep and food and care for self for the life of the little one. It reaches out like a patriot's love that risks life for country. I want you to grow a leaf that reaches down. It reaches down to the one who does not understand, who does not have the strength, who does not have wisdom. It is the kind of endurance that my eldest son showed when the quartet of which he was a part in his, ca in his college days hiked down into Grand Canyon. <clears throat> they were young. They hiked too far. It was getting dark. And they discovered it's harder going up than going down. In fact, they were exhausted. Two had gone on ahead, but Thomas was hanging back with his friend who was having the most difficulty encouraging him. But the other fellow just gave up. He collapsed by the path and said, just leave me. But the exhausted Thomas picked up his companion and carried him out of the canyon, piggyback. 
The next day, Thomas was unable to walk. His companion was just fine, but he owes his safety to my son's endurance. Third, I want you to grow a leaf that reaches higher than you've ever reached. Reach up to the sun and reign of God and the Holy Spirit. Learn to endure, rising above your circumstances and above your suffering as Jesus did. You may be surprised how many others will be lifted with you. Thirdly, the stem of suffering and the leaves of endurance produce blossoms. God's Holy Spirit pours God's love into your heart to build your character. Label the blossom character and make it a pretty one. A person of character is one who's been tested in the struggles of life and found to be reliable and trustworthy. When character is applied to an object, it means the object has been tested and found to be genuine or valuable. When applied to a person, that person is found to be significant, esteemed, worthy. A person of character has moral strength, has self-discipline, has fortitude. A person of character has a good reputation. Metal passed through fire is purged and is sterling. Man passing through affliction and suffering, meeting the suffering with endurance, is purged of the unnecessary, cleansed of the useless and unworthy, is made strong and pure and near to God. Having faced life's circumstances with all its trials and having conquered those trials, he meets life with eyes aflame with hope. Amen. All levels of our society... And some pulpits are full of tough guys with no character. A trip across British Columbia is helpful. On Highway 1, Rebecca and I used to live there for over 12 years. I've made the trip often. Leaving Vancouver, where we lived, the next uh, significant city is Hope. Hope, British Columbia. Hell's Gate is beyond hope. <laughs> it's true. And you go up Jackass Mountain and to Boston Bar to get to Hell's Gate. It sounds like a road map for contemporary life. But I want to assure you that a person of character lights up a room. A person of character makes people glad he has arrived. A person of character will become a mentor even when he didn't mean to because people will watch and model the blossom of his life. A person of character will draw people to himself without meaning to, just as a blossom attracts people to itself. The Holy Spirit pours God's love into your life to get you to bloom because it is the forebearer of fruit. That's number four. The stem of suffering and the leaves of endurance and the blossom of character produce hope. Fruit. The Holy Spirit pours God's love into your heart to fill you with hope. We are a hope-starved society. Too many people show signs of desperation and hopelessness. Yes. We had hoped that our technology would save us. We had hoped that advanced medical procedures and drugs would save us. We had hoped that strong economic development would save us. We had hoped that super intelligent people with excellent education would save us. We had hoped that if we could just amass enough information, hello internet, it would save us. One by one, all these have turned on us and frightened us and left us looking in another direction for hope. The fact is this. When the process of secularization has gone the furthest, by secularization I mean a society that attempts to live without God. You understand what I mean? The process of secular, where it has gone the furthest, 
utilizing technology and education, do you know that crime and violence have escalated in its path? The suicide rate has rocketed. Do you know that mental disease has increased almost beyond the power of psychiatry to cope with it? And thousands have sought relief for their despair in drugs. But we know that the Holy Spirit of God pours God's love into our hearts to fill us with hope. While we are prone to put it at the bottom as all he had left was hope, Paul puts it at the top of the plant. We have come to the teleos, the purpose, the fulfillment, the maturity of our plant that the Holy Spirit has been watering. Our confident expectation is in the unseen and future, but it's based on what God has done in the past for which we have evidence and substance in the presence. Hope is the fruit that will not disappoint us. Amen. Hope fills us with joy. Hope gives peace that passes understanding. And here's why. Here's why. Verse 2, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Now it may be tough in the present. But the day is coming when we shall participate in the glory of God. He is coming for his own. We may presently groan inwardly, but we await for our adoption as sons, for the redemption of our bodies. We will be liberated from the bondage of the decay of the creation and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For in this hope we were saved. Amen. Oh, Spirit of God, keep pouring into our hearts your own spirit of love, the love of God. Amen. I choose to conclude my talk by reading a letter written to my daughter Priscilla by a schoolmate of hers. Hi. I was just thinking of something and I wanted to tell you. And I want you to pass the message along to your parents. We've been discussing God's love and how Christians are often guilty of not being loving. We judge others. We turn our backs on those in need. We think we're better than others. Now, we're human, but as Christians, we should strive to be more loving, more Christ-like in nature. In a writer's group that I'm in, we've discussed, we've discussed this a lot lately. And in our little country church, we've worked hard at being loving. We have a growing congregation. We don't reach out to people who are in church but are unhappy. We reach out to the lost, to the unchurched. God is blessing that. But here's the problem. People in the community say things like, why do you bother with those people? Well, why did Jesus bother with Paul? Why did Jesus bother with Zacchaeus? Why did Jesus bother with us? I continue to quote here. I bother with these people because Jesus bothered with me. He cared about me. In the midst of my teenage years when I was wandering in the dark, he sent me friends to care. He sent you and your family at one of the darkest times in my life. Your parents didn't say, oh, no way do we want that rebellious kid in our house. Instead, they took me in for that week. They fed me. They loved me. I've always remembered that. I'm the person in ministry that I am because of your parents. I can love unlovable kids. I can care about the people who have strayed far from God and live lives that others can't understand. 
Why did we bother? Because God wouldn't have it any other way. Love you.